Hello, everybody. Welcome to our, our next topic in grade 12 U physics. Um, so today we're going to be doing some work with uh, with friction and other resistive forces. Uh, and again, we'll start by reviewing some grade 11 topics and then building on those and moving into some grade 12 stuff. Uh, so we'll start with uh, with friction. Uh, and hopefully you remember that friction is a force that always opposes the relative motion of two objects in contact. And what that means is uh, they'll always try and stop a certain motion from happening. Um, and that the friction force direction is always opposite the relative motion of the two objects and parallel to the surfaces. So what that means is um, if, let's say, you're rubbing two objects together, let's say you've got a, a book on a desk. So there's the book, there's the desk. Um, and if you're trying to slide the book so it's traveling this way, uh, any sort of forces that are, that are acting, so if this is the applied force here, uh, the, the friction force will always be this way. Notice it's parallel to the surface and it's opposite the motion of the actual uh, uh, object itself. Uh, and you remember as well that the magnitude of the friction force depends on two major factors, uh, those factors being the normal force between the two objects and the nature of the materials themselves. And those are again given by the coefficients of friction, uh, mu, so we have mu s and we have mu k. We'll talk about those guys in a little bit more uh, in just a second. The two types of friction then we have that match up with those two different coefficients are static and kinetic. Uh, static uh, is a force that opposes the start of relative motion. So something sitting on, on an object, uh, if you push it, it's not going to move until you uh, overcome static friction. Uh, and kinetic friction is the force that opposes the continuation of relative motion. So two things that are already in motion, it will try and, and stop that motion from continuing. So if we spend a little bit of time just exploring those forces in a little more detail, um, so kinetic friction versus static friction. So we've got a nice little table there uh, at the top. Uh, and so it's a constant resistive force for kinetic friction. Uh, what that means is anytime the objects are sliding, it will always be the same size force. So it's a constant. Uh, and it's given by this expression, mu k f n. Again, f n being normal and mu k being this coefficient of kinetic friction, which uh, depends on the nature of the materials. Look those up in tables. Uh, common values again um, from uh, 0.1 up to almost 1. Uh, higher coefficients than one are possible, but not very common. So there's kinetic friction. Uh, static friction, this is a non-constant resistive force. What I mean by that is that it actually changes. So uh, it's going to grow from zero to some other maximum value as you apply more and more force. So if you imagine you have, again, uh, an object. Let's say you've got an object sitting here. It's resting on a, on, on a surface. As I apply a force here, friction force will exactly match it, uh, exactly matching the static friction force, but if I push harder and harder, again, the static friction force will be harder and harder, but eventually, the static friction will reach a maximum value, that Fs max, and once it does, then the object will start to move, so motion will happen in this way, and again, that happens as you increase the, uh, the applied force over the static friction maximum force, and the maximum static friction force is given by this expression here, um, and it's, uh, it depends, again, on mu s and fn. Uh, and just so you know, mu s is, in general, larger than or equal to mu k. Um, so you're always going to have uh, more force to get something moving than it is to keep it moving. Uh, to give you another idea, if we take a look at a graph, the red line here shows the force of friction uh, uh, an object um, experiences as a, a larger and larger applied force is, uh, is applied to it. So it starts at 0, 0, which means no applied force, no friction force. But then as the applied force grows, the friction force, of course, grows to match it. Uh, it would be an exactly one relationship. So uh, two newtons applied force, two newtons frictional force, and it will keep growing in tandem until it reaches this value of Fs max, so this value right here. Once it does, um, it will start to move. And now we're out of the static uh, friction regime, and we're going to be looking at kinetic friction. And that's this value down here, Fk. Uh, and of course, this is a constant. So no matter how much your applied force is, the kinetic friction will be the same. Another sort of really important resistive force is uh, fluid friction, and this is the uh, the resistant or resistance to an object uh, moving through another substance. So anytime it moves through a fluid, and just in case you don't know, uh, in physics, a fluid is any substance in which uh, particles are relatively free to slide past one another. And so, some common examples of fluids would be things like water, oil, air, uh, honey. Coke, so any sort of, of uh, substance where the particles can freely slide past one another. Uh, and anytime you try and move an object through that, 
there will be a resistive force, so something that tries to stop it. And we're going to call that force drag. Uh, and the neat thing about drag is that it's uh, where it actually comes from. There, there is a little bit of frictional component, but a lot of it also comes from pushing objects out of the way. So again, if you imagine that you're trying to drag an object through uh, a big uh, connection or big uh, collection of, of uh, materials, let's pretend I've got a big tank of, let's say, water. So there's water particles all through this tank. And inside of this tank, I also have an object that I want to drag through. So let's say I've got, uh, I don't know, this object here, and I want to pull it up. So not only is this uh, object going to slide, let's say, next to these particles as it moves up, but it's actually going to push this particle out of the way. And so that's going to be your drag force, or going to be the cause of your drag force. Uh, and so drag force is a non-constant force. It depends on lots and lots of things. Uh, but the one that's kind of important here is speed. So the faster something goes, the more force it will feel, the more drag it feels. Uh, the most common example we have in everyday life is air resistance, and that's the force of drag on an object as it's moving through the air. One of the most common examples you probably have is if you uh, ever stick your hand out of a car window while driving. Uh, you know when you're traveling slowly, uh, there's not a huge force acting on your arm, but as you travel faster and faster, the force increases. So uh, there's a good example for uh, air resistance depending on speed. One of the biggest examples of air resistance, uh, or applications of it anyways, is terminal velocity. Uh, and so what this is, this is an object falling through the air. So remember, uh, if I drop any object near Earth, it will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared, so long as we can ignore all resistive forces. Well, since we're talking about resistive forces, I don't think that would be a good idea to do that right now. So uh, let's consider resistive forces here. And if we consider what an object does as it's falling, uh, well, the two forces acting on it will be the force of gravity pulling it down and the force of air resistance pulling it up. So the force of gravity is a constant. And again, hopefully remember the force of gravity is just given by a pretty simple expression. So Fg equals Mg. And so unless I change G or I change M, um, then you're not going to have the force of gravity changing. So as long as we're dropping an object of constant mass near Earth, that'll stay the same. But what does happen is the air resistance will change. And that's, again, because uh, as it's falling faster and faster, the force of air resistance becomes larger and larger. And once it becomes the same as the force of gravity, we now have zero uh, net force, or sorry, zero uh, overall force, which means zero acceleration, which means this will now be traveling at a constant velocity. So looking over here at our VT graph, this section would match up with this graph. And uh, any sort of time in between here, so going up and around here at these spots, this would then be your uh, spot with it. Air, uh, the force of air resistance is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And again, we'd call this maximum velocity here, this would be your terminal velocity or terminal speed. Um, and unless you change something, like the shape of the object or, uh, or its mass, then this number will be a constant for that object while it's sliding. So those are the two kinds of resistive forces we want to talk about, uh, friction and um, uh, fluid drag. And let's take a look at a couple examples then. So here's one of uh, Rachel wants to hold the textbook of mass 1.2 kilograms against the wall by pushing straight horizontally. So what I'm talking about is if we imagine uh, a side view here of this thing. So here's the, uh, here's the wall, and then I've got this object here. This would be the textbook, and it has a mass of 1.2 kilograms. And Rachel wants to push in this direction. So I'll say FR for force of Rachel uh, and hold that book up there. So hopefully you can imagine that uh, Rachel pushing into the wall doesn't actually hold the book up directly. There's other things going on. And if we think about the other forces acting on here, we've got quite a few. So let's draw a free body diagram. So we've got the force of Rachel pushing the book into the wall. And then we've also got Newton's third law says we have to have a reaction force to that. So if uh, Rachel's pushing on the wall, or sorry, the book from Rachel is pushing on the wall, the wall will push back on the book. And so we'll have a normal force. And of course, we're on Earth, we can assume, so we'll always have gravity. And if this were the, the only forces acting on it, then I imagine you could see that the book would then accelerate down, and it wouldn't stick to the wall. But since it does stick to the wall, there's got to be another force up. And if we stop and think about it for a second, hopefully you can agree that's got to be friction. We have the book rubbing against the wall, so that there is going to be a force of friction acting on there. And if we're talking about um, holding the wall, or sorry, holding the book, then this will be static friction.
And the last thing we have to worry about is uh, we want to know the minimum force she needs to apply. So what is the minimum that Rachel can apply to just hold the book steady? So if we're looking for the minimum uh, force for the force for Rachel, that means we need to have the maximum static friction force. So this will be our mu s fn. And again, we want the sum of all the forces here to be equal to zero because we don't want this thing to accelerate. We want the book to hold steady. All right, so we've kind of set up our problem. Uh, and then we want to start breaking this stuff up into different uh, components and see if we can figure out what's going on. So we know the sum of the forces is zero. So what that means is that any opposite force has to be equal. So that means the normal force has to be equal to the force of Rachel. And that means that the force of gravity has to be equal to Fs max. Notice I am dropping the vector sign here. So we're talking about the magnitudes. Uh, so we want the, the uh, magnitude of the normal force is equal to the magnitude of Rachel's force and likewise for the force of gravity and static friction. So we're stuck here. We have these two equations that we don't seem to have information to solve uh, because we need the force for Rachel. Uh, we know the force of gravity. That's pretty easy, but we don't seem to have the other forces yet. So what we can do is work backwards from our static friction force. So our maximum static friction force is given by this expression. So here is our link between Fn and Fg. So what I can say then is that mu s fn equals mg. And again, I can go back and say, well, I know from up here that I wanted the normal force equal to Rachel's force. So mu s fr equals mg. Do a little bit of arranging, and the force from Rachel has to be equal to mg divided by mu s. Uh, and again, you plunk some numbers in here, and you should come up with a force of 15 newtons. Now, just quickly before we move on from this problem, one thing I want to kind of point out uh, is what would happen if there were no friction in this case. Uh, so let's go up to our diagram again. And if we imagine that we got rid of friction so that this, uh, this were a perfectly friction-free environment, this force would go to zero. And it would seem like that there would be no possible way to hold this book up. What we want to do is just see if our equation actually verifies that. And it kind of does. Because if you look at this sort of uh, this last equation down here, if mu s is zero, that would be no friction. And if you divide a number by zero, yes, your calculator says error. But as mu s gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the force of uh, required from Rachel would go up and up and up. And so if mu s were zero, we can almost imagine the force of Rachel would be infinite. So we would take an infinite force from Rachel to hold that book up uh, if there were no friction. So I think, again, that matches kind of with our expectations of what the physics would look like. And one more question that I, uh, I'll work with you guys, a little bit more complicated. Uh, we have these two blocks uh, connected by an ideal string that passes over an ideal pulley. And I've told you the coefficient of kinetic friction uh, and the masses of these blocks. And I want to know, what is the acceleration of M1? And again, you probably ask yourself, well, what the heck is this thing? Seems like a very contrived problem. Uh, it is slightly, but uh, if you can believe me that this sort of method anyways will uh, come in useful later. So if you remember from the stuff we did yesterday, uh, the first thing I said it's probably useful to do is decide on a, uh, a coordinate system in which way positive is. Uh, and in this case, I think it makes sense to say that positive is this way. And again, being because our natural inclination is that M2 will move down and M1 will move to the right. So let's go with that sort of idea and see if we can verify it. So we've got a system diagram already there. Let's then start drawing a free body diagram for number one. So the force is acting on one. And we'll do the same thing for the force is acting on two. So let's start with two. So what forces are acting on two? Well, uh, we know that we decided positive is this way. And there should be two forces acting on two. Force of gravity, of course, so I'll call it Fg2. And we've also got the force of tension pulling it back up. There is only one string, so we don't have to put a number on there. We can just call it Ft and leave it. Uh, and then if we go back to block one, again, our coordinate system says we're going to have positive going to the right, and the forces are acting on it, but we have tension pulling it to the right. We have its own gravity pulling it down. But we've also got some other forces. We have the normal force pushing it up from the desk, and we've got the friction force acting on number one. And again, it's the only friction force involved, so I'm going to drop the one subscript for right now. So uh, what we want to do is then use Newton's second law for each of these objects and write a Newton's second law statement. So this idea of the sum of the forces equals ma, uh, and the same over here for 
block two. So let's just work on block number one for the time being, and let's get an expression for uh, the net force and see what we come up with. All right, so the forces we have acting, uh, we can agree again, hopefully, that the, uh, the, the normal force and the gravity force should cancel each other out uh, because the block is not going to accelerate into or out of the, um, uh, the table. So that'll be uh, a zero. So then for the sum of the forces, I can just use the tension force and the kinetic friction force. And following the positive axis I, I uh, decided on, that means I'm going to have as my uh, statement here for F net, so Ft minus Fk is going to be equal to M1A. And then I know that Fk is equal to mu k Fn, so we can say Ft minus mu k Fn is equal to M1A. Uh, keep going along with the same idea here. And we can say that Ft minus mu k M1G is equal to M1A. And then Ft is equal to uh, M1A plus mu k M1G. So now we have an expression for the tension force in terms of the acceleration and other known values, because we know M1, we know mu k, and we know G. All right, so there's enough for the first one. Let's now turn our attention to the second block and do the same sort of thing. So Fg2 minus Ft is going to be equal to M2A. So Ft will then be equal to Fg2 minus M2A, or the force of tension is equal to M2G minus M2A. So again, now we have two equations uh, with two unknowns, our unknowns being A and Ft. Since we want to find the acceleration, let's sub in Ft for one into the other. So then I'll take this Ft and sub it in for this one and say M2G minus M2A equals M1A plus mu k M1G. Just taking again the terms from each of these separate equations and combining them together. Do a little bit of rearranging, a little bit of some algebra. I'll jump a step or two here. And again, if you're confused, talk to me in class uh, tomorrow. But then A turns out to be M2 minus mu k M1 divided by M1 plus M2 all times G. We shove the numbers in, we know, and we get our acceleration turns out to be positive 1.49545 meters per second squared. And before we just summarize it, let's make sure that this makes sense with our common sense. So we have a positive number, which means the acceleration should be in the same direction we assign positive to be, which again makes sense. So I think we're pretty confident in our answer here. And we have an acceleration then for this object of 1.5 meters per second squared. And since we asked for object uh, one, that's the one on the table, we know that acceleration is to the right. Okay, so I think that's enough uh, examples there. And again, uh, if you have any questions, please bring them to me in class tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing everybody again tomorrow.